I'm Diane Randall. I am the Executive Secretary of the Friends Committee on National Legislation, and I want to welcome everyone across the country who's participating in our first ever webinar in house parties in, um, I think, over 20 states and probably over 25 locations. We are really thrilled that you are making time this afternoon to learn more about advocacy and to learn more about how you can influence what your elected officials do here in Washington, D.C. So I'm really thrilled to be here with two colleagues from the Hill and with a live audience. We have some of our faithful general committee supporters from the Friends Committee on National Legislation who are with us. Um, we know that this is a very uh, important time. Um, I mean, it's always an important time in Washington, but right now this issue of the federal budget is going to be consuming um, the Senate and the House um, over the next couple of months. And so I'd like to introduce uh, both of you and then ask you to talk a little bit about that, both from the policy perspective as well as from our faith perspective, why we do this. So Martha, I'm gonna start with you. Martha Coven is a visiting professor and lecturer at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. She teaches domestic policy there and she consults with a variety of nonprofits, providing advice, training, research services. Her experience includes more than 20 years in the executive branch, legislative branch, and nonprofit sector. Most recently, she spent six years in the Obama White House. From 2009 to 2011, Martha served as a special assistant to the president at the Domestic Policy Council, where she advised on poverty and workforce issues and developed that famous plan for addressing childhood obesity, which is really exciting. From 2011 to 2014, she served as Associate Director for Education, Income Maintenance, and Labor in the Office of Management and Budget. And prior to joining the administration, Coven worked in the Legislative Affairs at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, which is a real uh, strong colleague of ours here at, in Washington. She began her career on Capitol Hill working for the House Minority Leader and a senior member of the House Appropriations Committee. Welcome, Martha. Thank you. And uh, my friend and colleague, Reverend Andrea Alexander, is Associate General Secretary at the National, for Action and Advocacy for Justice and Peace at the National Council of Churches of Christ in the USA. The National Council of Churches, or the NCC as we call it here, is a leading force for ecumenical cooperation among Christians in the United States and focuses on issues of social justice, interreligious relationships, the Bible, and Christian life. Reverend Alexander leads the organization's advocacy efforts, um, and we have been on the Hill together, and I know she'll probably talk about some of the visits we've had and why it matters for people of faith to lobby. Two of the priority issues that Andrea is really focused on are mass incarceration and interreligious peace. For over 20 years, she's worked in partnership with ecumenical interfaith and government entities, such as the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, the United Nations, and the World Council of Churches, Church World Services, and with other justice issues. She preaches, she lectures, she facilitates workshops throughout the United States and around the world, including Egypt, South Africa, Turkey, Mexico, and South Korea. She's a former lawyer, and uh, received both her JD and BS from the University of Missouri in Columbia. She uh, has her MDiv from the Princeton Theological Seminary, and she's a member of the National Advisory Board for Community Engagement in the State Courts and co-chair of the Interfaith Criminal Justice Coalition. So you can see we have two people who have a great deal of expertise and uh, background in the issues that we wanna talk about today. So I wanna start off uh, with you, Martha, and just ask you to talk a little bit about where we are now and what we are facing over the next couple of months. Yes, so you are absolutely right that it is a big moment. We are entering a big moment or in a big moment for these kinds of federal budget decisions. So thank you for having me here to talk about um, these very important matters. By law, Congress is supposed to craft a budget plan once a year, kind of look around at the circumstances we have in the world, think about our priorities, and put together a plan for the year. They have been struggling to do that, and part of the reason they've been struggling is there is so much disagreement right now um, and a real effort to shift the direction of, of what had been a consensus 
um, that they're having trouble putting things together, which is why it's so important to have people weighing in and saying, here's what matters to my community, whether that's your faith community, your local community, what have you. So there are essentially three main issues that are under dispute and that are preventing them from coming to agreement on a budget, although that's what they are earnestly trying to do this fall and, and likely will do. The first, um, the first two have to do with how much we spend and what we spend on. So there is a big question about whether what level of defense spending we should have. And the president in particular, but the House of Representatives also, has been very determinedly trying to ramp up very substantially how much we spend mm -hmm. in defense. The other aspect of spending is what everything else, right? What do we spend here at home? What do we spend on education and environmental protection and housing assistance and health care and the social safety net? And in that domain, there has been a, a complementary effort to try to drive down our investments, particularly again on the part of the President and the House of Representatives. The Senate, which operates as a bipartisan institution at most times, is much less sure about whether or not we want to drive down our domestic investments. So we've got this un unclear picture. Are, are we driving up defense spending? Are we then cutting domestic spending to pay for that and other matters? Or are we trying to invest in our future and so on? So there's first defense spending, second domestic spending, and then the third issue is how we pay for it. Budgets aren't just spending, it's where the money comes from. And there is a very uh, lively debate going on right now about whether who should be paying taxes and whether we are collecting um, too much or not enough. And so right now there has been, again, led by the White House and largely with the support of the House and with the support of many people in the Senate, but it's not a done deal yet, this notion that we should be passing very large tax cuts that are tilted towards the people who are already doing quite well in our society, whether that's corporations or individuals doing well, which will do two things. One is sort of shift resource, again, shift the balance of who's paying taxes away from the people who have the most to give. Um, but then secondly, deplete some of the resources we need to invest in our communities and invest in our future. So all three of what I've described as dials, the defense dial, the domestic dial, and the tax dial are ones that they are struggling to figure out how to fine tune, and that's where input from people around the country is so important. Great, thank you. That's very uh, great overview of kind of the big challenges ahead. So the Friends Committee on National Legislation has long held a position that we think um, our Congress is spending too much on the Pentagon. We think that there are ways that um, we should be reducing that amount of money. And we have uh, people across the country who are lobbying for that. We talk to our members, talk to the members of Congress about that on a regular basis. We are also concerned about this domestic spending and particularly for human needs and for the critical issues that um, make communities strong and uh, bring equity and justice to everyone. Um, and that comes from our faith perspective as friends and the Religious Society of Friends. Um, Andrea, I know you come from the Baptist tradition and, and work, but you work with Christian churches all over exactly. and, and work on justice and peace. Could you talk a little bit about that from your perspective and how that informs your advocacy? Um, yes, and, and yes, I'm Baptist, but I often talk about how as the uh, National Council of Churches, I'm kind of quite a few of our affiliations um, growing up in a family that was Methodist and Baptist and work, Baptist and uh, working with, with various others. But um, there's so many different reasons as people of faith why we do what we do. Um, being Baptist, we're real biblically focused. So there's um, Jesus telling us in the great commandment to love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Uh, meaning that all of who we are uh, and love your neighbor as yourself. So so often people are only concerned about what affects affects them and them alone. Mm -hmm. I like to use the example of, and, and you hear this often, if you're walking by a house and it's burning, do you just keep walking? You know, if you walk by, does it have to be your house? Does it have to be your neighbor's home? You're gonna do something about it. And quite frankly, what's happening right now is the house is burning. Mm -hmm. And that house being the, is, is our nation. And it's so many issues right now that we're dealing with the budget is a picture and reflection of who we are as a people. Um, another biblical text talks about where your heart is, there so are your treasures. Um, our country is no different. Our, the way we spend our money is a reflection of who we are as a nation and the way we engage the, the legislator, uh, legislation on how money is spent also is a reflection of our values. And so um, as we talk about these various um, uh, avenues of the budget, 
Uh, I, did, I do have something I'd like to share that I really love looking at as an example. In 2016, the militarized budget for prison, deportation, and military, so the combination of the budget for 2016 that was for incarceration, dealing with uh, deportation, and military was $741 billion. That was 21, 2016. With $741 billion, one million new infrastructure jobs until 2030 could have been uh, created. You could have funded Head Start for 92 years. Mm -hmm. Low income heating assistance for 21 years could have been provided for. We could have provided low income housing vouchers for 32 years. WIC, the Women, Infants, and Children's Nutrition Program, could be funded for 177 years. That is, if you look at the juxtaposition of what we spend on, on controlling people's lives and um, destroying people's lives, this is what we could be doing domestically. And so you say, why do we do this from a faith perspective? Because it is imperative. Mm. Um, and also because it matters. I was just in a meeting yesterday um, with a, uh, a member's uh, staffer who said to us, you may not know it, but your voice really matters. And, you know, we do wonder sometimes. We do. But he's, and he said it several times, and it's told to us, it's, we've, we've told, we're told that often. Um, Interfaith Criminal Justice Coalition actually moved Senator Grassley to uh, even put a, a sentencing bill on the floor. They had all of it done, there was conversation, there's bipartisan support, but he wasn't interested. And it was the faith community through a letter, we wrote a letter, had it signed by uh, faith communities uh, throughout uh, uh, Iowa, and it made it in the newspaper. And he wasn't happy with that. So your voice matters. Um, and we're, we're responsible, um, and we're obligated to do that because our lives are not just our own. Mm, thank you for that. Uh, well said. And I want to I want to pick up on two themes that you talked about, and then I want to come back to Martha and talk just a little bit more details about sort of some of the terminology that we hear uh, that people may be hearing as the federal budget is debated. But the theme I want to pick up on is the one you used about militarization. That has been a concern of ours for a long time. Uh, friends have a peace testimony that we talk about, which really compels us to not fight and to be practice nonviolence, and so. We are concerned when our foreign policy is militarized and our domestic policy is militarized through excessive incarceration or even excessive, uh, the so-called border wall, uh, that is of concern to us. In addition to the excessive expenditures at the Pentagon, we think are far beyond. And so right now, as Martha said, we have a proposed budget that the President sent to Congress that increases the Pentagon by tens of billions of dollars, and we have both Republicans and some Democrats who would like to spend that much money on the Pentagon. Um, we, we, our concern is sometimes about these trade-offs that you talked about, mm -hmm. that if we're gonna spend that much more on the Pentagon, then where will we get that money? Are we gonna raise taxes, or are we gonna take it from, another, from, the, from the domestic uh, expenditures? So the other situation we have right now is people may remember that a few years ago, the Congress passed something called the Budget Control Act that actually put caps on the annual, how much we can spend, right? And that, so there's, a, there's parity between, supposedly, defense should not spend more than uh, domestic spends. And so we're also a little bit concerned about that. Could you talk about those budget control caps and what might happen with that, what we might see happening so um, you're absolutely right about six years now there was legislation enacted called the Budget Control Act that kind of in, in two rounds essentially after Congress failed to come up with an alternative version it, it came into full force and what it did is deeply constrained the third or so of the federal budget that we call discretionary or annual appropriations. About half of that money is the Defense Department as you said and related activities and half of it is we call non-defense um, discretionary. Um, there are other programs that are not subject to these caps. Right. There are big ones like Social Security, mm -hmm. Medicare, Medicaid, these big promises that we have made that are so integral to people's lives. And there are separate debates going on right now about healthcare, which we may talk about. Yes. But to look at that piece that is capped under this Budget Control Act, 
You're right, the, the caps were sent essentially so that the, those two halves of the uh, discretionary budget defense and non-defense would be roughly equivalent. I think perhaps, um, perhaps even more importantly, over the intervening years, Congress and the President have agreed that the caps were somewhat too tight, and a couple times, in a couple rounds, there have been bipartisan deals, Speaker Ryan, and um, working um, now Speaker Ryan being integrally involved in those to relieve a little bit of the pressure on the caps on both sides because of a concern in Congress and the part of Americans writ large that those cuts were just going to be too difficult for our communities to absorb. So every time they've relieved the pressure a little bit, they have done it according to, as you said, this parity principle. If we're going to let a little bit more defense spending in, then we have to let a commensurate number of domestic, amount of domestic spending in. And they've done this in two rounds. For the last several years, there's been a little bit of pressure eased on those caps. They found other ways to pay for that so that it didn't add to the deficit. A little bit of pressure on those caps, always parity. And what we have now that could be such a departure from the past is a number of people, again, including the President, but also many members of Congress saying, forget the parity principle. Mm -hmm. It's okay if we drive down education spending. It's okay if we don't take care of our affordable housing crisis. We just want to pump a lot of money into the defense side of the equation. Parity is, is not something we're interested in anymore. And that is a very live debate that, that will be a big part of resolving these budget issues this fall. And the other concern, I'm going to introduce another wonky term, but it's <laughs> one that we've talked to some of our constituents a lot about, and that's this, um, what I'm going to call a slush fund. Um, the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund, which also is a big chunk of money that the Defense Department has had at its access, uh, created really to fight wars. Um, and that chunk of money has continued to be used. And so there's some kind of gimmickry going on. I, I mean, from our point of view, we feel like there's an effort uh, by Congress sometimes to try to pump money into the defense by using that off-budget accounting. Um, and thereby get around the parity issue. And so we're very concerned that whatever gets counted in terms of spending at the Pentagon or the Department of Defense counts everything that's spent, both this overseas contingency operations money as well as the regular order budgeting. So that's just one that people who are doing advocacy with FCNL are going to continue hearing about because we um, are hoping that the people listening today, the people who are enjoying your house parties, um, are going to uh, take a next step and talk to your members of Congress. And, and I want to just ask a little bit, Martha and Andrea both, I mean, Andrea, you mentioned that when you go in, you, you hear and we hear members of Congress say, you know, often we'll, we go in and make a pitch and afterwards we'll say to them, um, what more can we do? And a lot of times we'll hear them say, keep talking to us, mm -hmm. or make sure that your colleagues talk to people in Iowa, or in Oklahoma, or in Oregon. You know, we have people say that. But what, what difference does it make? I mean, talk a little bit more why it matters for people in local districts, not just people in Washington, to be talking to their elected officials. Uh, well, uh, uh, I, think, I, I think it's time one, in. as I just said, they actually let us know that our voice matters. Um, people are intimidated with the idea of going and making their voice heard. Mm. But what I tell people is, and, and there are those who believe that we shouldn't be doing what we do because of a misunderstanding about the separation of church and state, for instance. What I tell people, and this is really true, um, the, the separation of church and state is to protect you from the government, not the government from you. <laughs> <laughs> they should be, you, you, they should be both excited to see you and, and depending on what you're going to see, say them about, it's like, oh my God, here come those Quakers again. Um, <laughs> the, you know, that faith community people are really like, oh my God, I really, I better be really prepared for them. Um, and don't be intimidated. You are the, you, your vote, not only do you go out to vote, we're really important, everybody understands the importance of voting, but often we forget that we have to also help people be accountable. And these are, every, these are normal people. The sad part is, is most of, a lot of times our legislators, this is really sad. A lot of them are voting on stuff that you know more about than they do. They need to hear your stories. They need to understand the impact that these laws are making. Sometimes they just get so caught up in what they're doing on Capitol Hill or 
in Iowa or um, um, Minnesota, Kansas City, whatever. And until they hear a personal story, a community mm -hmm. story, of, it is in our tradition, a testimony of what they're doing and how it makes a difference, they really don't know. And sometimes they get so caught up in doing what they do, quite frankly, there are times when they don't care. And we have to remind them to care. They're good people, I believe. I they go and most people, I think, when they start off running for office, they really want to go out and make a difference. And they get in Washington or they get into whatever their state legislative uh, body is, and people start making deals and they're trading stuff, and they don't realize what they're trading is other people's lives. Right. And so we have to remind them of that. And you don't have to be intimidated by it. You voted them in, you know, and most of them are going to come to the state fair and whatever the thing is, and they're out there waving. Make them listen to you. Don't just go for photo ops. <laughs> Tell your stories. That's great. Thank you for the part about the personal stories. Martha, what did you see when you worked both at the White House and on the Hill? You obviously met with a lot of constituents. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what affected you as the yeah. person on the other side. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely endorse everything that Andrea said, and just to build on that, I mean, first of all, it is a re we have this wonderful thing called a representative democracy. They do work for us, and our voices matter, not just at the ballot box, but throughout their tenure in this representation role. So, no question. In terms of, um, let me say maybe particularly people of faith, how, are, how can they be influential in then sort of the role of stories, because I think both are relevant and they can be connected. People of faith, I think, are extra powerful in advocacy. And the reason is that when you walk in the door um, with the people from your faith community representing your faith community, there's, an, there's a generally an automatic assumption on the part of the legislator or the public official, if you're talking about the executive branch that you're dealing with, that you are not acting in your narrow self-interest. Mm -hmm. What brought you in the door is some commonly held values, some sense of community as you define it, but you're walking in not as you, but as, as the set of values that you walk in the door with. That makes you so much more powerful because lots of people will walk in that door and they'll say, oh, that person's just shilling for the whatever industry, or that person's just looking out for himself. But when you walk in the door as a faith community, those that's not what you walk in the door with. So you are powerful. Um, and I think faith voices off, I mean, many circumstances have helped to kind of bring both parties together on difficult issues. Um, you know, thinking about in the past issues on public benefits and um, about how we treat people from other countries, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of the value of stories, though, I think, um, again, you, you don't realize how much you have the ability to shift how a legislator thinks about something. I mean, right now, we're all seeing how much Jimmy Kimmel is changing mm, yes. how members of Congress evaluate a health care uh, this healthcare legislation. There is a Jimmy Kimmel story in every issue you work on in every single congressional district. And every time you come in and tell your story, that might be the one that sticks. That might be the one that stays in a member of Congress's head and says, wow, whatever that story is, I need to do right by that person in my community. I need to make sure the decisions I'm making are moving that person's life in the right direction letters and calls and all of that are wonderful do it as much as you can but when you have the chance to put yourself um, or others in your community directly in front of a legislator you can really change their frame you don't always for you know for the nine times you, the ten times you try nine times might not but that one time that you latch on could change everything so I really do hearing from people they might be sitting back and you know stern-faced and not letting on that you're having an impact on them I guarantee that you mm -hmm. are every <laughs> single time and I think we've, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna segue a little bit off of the discussion about the federal budget, although it impacts it, to talk about healthcare, because you raised healthcare, and we are in this moment right now, about this week, considering yet another effort to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, and uh, the implications for that are enormous. And as we've lobbied on this issue, Andre and I have done this together over the summer, one of the things that we've seen, I think, is how personal this is. We all need health care, right? We all, this, this concerns every single person. And so the stories, uh, everyone has a story about something. But um, I don't know, Martha, do you want to say a word or two just about this week, what, what we might expect, and why it is so important, even if you know 
my member is definitely going to support this Cassidy Graham bill, or my member, my senator is definitely going to oppose it. Why does it matter if anybody makes a phone call Monday to that member of to that senator? Yeah. Wow. I mean that it's crunch time, and it's like they always pay attention, but then when crunch time comes, they really pay attention because. There is just because of the technical way the budget process works, they have until September 30th to use this, you know, simple majority only in the Senate, which means they don't need a single Democratic vote to get health, this health care repeal bill done. But they have to do it by the end of the week if they're going to do it or if they, they have to start this process all over again, which for a variety of reasons they may not want to do. So they are extremely focused. All the antenna are up. And a number of them, I mean, the media is focused more. So to your point about when things pop in the newspaper, mm -hmm. you know, it, we all feel that way as human beings, but they definitely feel that way as elected officials, right? When the media is covering every twist and turn, and who did they talk to, and what did someone say to them? I just think it's their list. They're sort of in hyper listening mode. Again, even if the outward expression doesn't seem that way, I guarantee you, someone sitting there counting phone calls in favor against, counting emails, relating stories. Um, all of that. I think maybe one other thing I'll say is that in addition to your own voice, sometimes the most powerful voices are the state and local leaders mm -hmm. who you may be very close to because of the work mm -hmm. you do in your community. You, some of you may even be state legislators, what have you. Um, so being able to speak not just sort of as your individual member of the faith community, but having your state and local leaders speak up and say, we don't want to be handed this mess that's in this bill. We can't handle this. People will suffer if you hand us this. Leave us holding the bag. Don't do it. That's another way you can influence, too, is making sure that your state and locals are expressing themselves to the feds, as many of them now are. It's really powerful to see the governors and other state leaders stepping up and saying, here's what's going to happen in my state if you do this. And I think this particular bill, the Graham-Cassidy bill, part of it relates to what you said, Andrea, about um, caring for other people. Yeah. Um, because the concerns we've had about this bill um, are some of the same concerns about the federal budget is that the implications maybe immediately aren't as known but in two years, three years, four years, five years, we're going to see millions of people affected and in particular people who are very low income, um, yeah. children, people with disabilities, the elderly. And so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. I think, I think one of the things that I've been heartened about in this debate is, is both that we have seen an outpouring of people who are coming and saying, no, this health care bill is working. There are problems with it. I'd still like to see it fixed, but it's important. And then secondly, that Medicaid is an important health care program that we value and want in our country. I, I think I, all of that is, is correct, but I also want to say the health care issue is the, the most, the marginalized of the marginalized are going to be deeply impacted and in, in actually probably relatively quickly or more so than others. But everyone will. I will yes. be affected. Yes. I'm on the exchange in, in DC, just as a personal story. Um, many people, I've talked to staffers and say, so you're helping your boss uh, craft a bill that will hinder your health care. Because that's, that's how widespread yes. and deeply impact this health care issue is. So I want people to, because there's also this way, as people of faith, we all kind of run into that kind of Messiah complex. We're going to really help. We go in and we go, like, oh, the poor people are going to lose their health care. No, a bunch of middle income people are going to lose their <laughs> health care. And in fact, what, what the, the Affordable Care Act really had a great impact on right. people who were in the middle, yeah. who could not afford health insurance, or uh, businesses that could not afford to, to cover people. So it's a whole slew. And one of the things that's taken place is the freezing out of the marketplace. You know, one of the th reasons things are going up is because the, uh, there's been a lot of problems with whether or not to fund in the, uh, the, 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 market, the, the marketplace and the, um, the supplements, the, su the, the supplemental uh, payments. So it's an issue that's going to affect a whole lot of people. And so um, I think that if you have not ever, if you've never ever done anything in the way of advocacy, this is the one to uh, cut your teeth on. This week. This week. <laughs> um, so I, and I think that people should do your, the visits, the phone calls. It is, it is absolutely amazing how many governors you know, we're right. hearing senators saying, and this is the way they do the whole, I, it's not my fault. I'm going to see what my governor says. We'll call the governor. And when the, co the governor is not accustomed, probably, to as many phone calls as they're going to get if you guys really get moving. So prayer vigils, 
phone calls show up on this particular one. And one thing that I think is extremely powerful about people of, uh, us being people of faith um, is that we really rely on a power greater than ourselves. So I don't like using the phrase that we're going to speak truth to power. We are people infused with power. That power being the God that is greater than all of us by ourselves. And we're speaking the truth. So we're taking that power and we're presenting truth to those who are in a position to make a difference in our lives. Thank you for that. That's great. Thanks. I want to go back and talk about the timing. This health care bill is this week. That's the, the action has to happen on Monday. I mean, the calls are really, this is like at the top of your to-do list on Monday morning. If you can call your two senators and tell them, do not vote against Graham Cassidy. That's the clear message. But the budget's going to be going on in the next couple of months. Um, and in the second hour of this uh, program today, people are going to be getting instructions about what they should do and how they can go about uh, taking the next step to advocate on the budget. I want to take a moment and just make sure people know that um, FCNL is having a lobby day in Washington on November 2nd through the 5th. We have our Quaker Public Policy Institute and our annual meeting. And anyone and everyone listening is certainly welcome to come to that. And it's fun because we think we'll have well over 400, we may even have 500 people up on the Hill talking to members of uh, Congress. And that's always a powerful uh, opportunity too. When you're walking down those halls and you see your, your, your folks that you were just sitting in worship with and they're in talking to their members. And you're right that there is a sense of empowerment. I've heard stories of people going in and just being able to tell their personal stories and having either the member or a staff person listen to it has a dramatic impact on us as individuals as well. But talk just a little bit about, I know there's a, there's a deadline coming up in December, but so we feel like the timing, this is really good prep for people to begin getting ready for this budget discussion and, and our, uh, our Quaker Public Policy Institute is at a good moment. Um, what's gonna be happening in the next two months and when should people be taking action? Yeah, well, and, and to your point on healthcare, I mean, early, as early as possible is always good, but frankly, continued checking in matters. I think one of the biggest dangers in advocacy is sort of saying your piece early, not re-entering the debate and then letting legislators say, well, I haven't heard from anybody in a while, so nobody must be caring, right? So there is just a bit of a drumbeat. But the timing um, is terrific to be coming in November, as you said. They will be trying to do a couple different things. One is make this budget blueprint going forward that will also inform what they do on taxes, but it will also, they'll also be having to deal with what to do on the spending bills that are due to be resolved in early December. So if you think about early November, they, they don't have a lot of time because there's Thanksgiving there, what have you, so they're, they're gonna be quite focused on these spending questions in November. And it does get back to the, where does our money go? Yeah. What values are we acting on? Are we going to be acting according to that bipartisan parity pr principle of making sure that we're attending to the priorities of those who believe in defense spending and the priorities of those who believe in d domestic spending? Or are we going to be saying domestic is not important to us, we don't mind the disinvestment in our children, in our needy, what have you, we're going to be rolling all the money into defense. So making sure that their voices explaining why those domestic investments are so important and should be the priority is critical. And, and let's talk just for a minute about yeah. what's in the domestic side of the budget. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people think, oh, I don't, I think we need to give more money to the military because I care about our veterans. Or, you know, I think we need to segment out a lot about that. And I, then I want to I wanna segue and talk a little bit about State Department, too, and diplomacy mm -hmm. and peace building, because that's another concern of ours. But what's yeah. in that so-called non-defense discretionary portion of the budget? What parts of our government are funded in that? Yeah, um, a lot of what we think of as sort of run of the mill and yet so important government and support to state and local governments as well. So education, environmental protection, affordable housing assistance, uh, cancer research and other kinds of research at the National Institutes of Health, um, veteran support for veterans medical care is part of that equation and that is a cost driver frankly sure. the medical costs are, are not rising as fast as they used to be thanks in part to the Affordable Care Act but they're still outpacing other costs so that's actually a squeeze within the domestic budget because it is considered domestic the veterans are here and the health care we provide to them is here so um, lots of different um, priorities are funded there not 
the big um, entitlement programs, those are kind of on their own trajectory, as I mentioned, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, what have you, although there's a risk to them too, which is that if um, Congress decides it wants to make deep cuts in taxes or a big ramp up in defense, and they don't want to increase the deficit, the money has to come from somewhere. And there have been really scary proposals to dismantle big parts of our social safety net and put a lot of low-income families at real risk in order to finance this other agenda of tax cuts and a defense buildup. So even though the, the, the things they're resolving in December are just how much do we put in the defense pot and how much do we put in this non-defense discretionary, we have to keep an eye on these other entitlements and the security they provide to American families and make sure they're not tampered with in the name of these other distorted priorities. So one of the um, uh, departments that gets funded in the non-defense discretionary is the U.S. State Department and U.S. Aid, uh, AID, um, our International Development Assistance. We just were on a trip to the Middle East with the National Council of Churches. We got to go to Beirut, to Cairo, and uh, to the West Bank, and to Israel. I don't know, Andre. Do you feel like you could say a little bit about why what we, you know, a little bit about what we heard in terms of the importance of diplomacy, the importance of de effective development and peace building, and why any cuts to those programs is really going to be devastating, particularly in light of a buildup of the Pentagon. I just, I think that one being um, it, it's traveling outside of the United States um, as an African American female. Uh, it's when I go outside of the states I realize a level of privilege that I have that I may not feel here. Um, we we were particularly concerned about uh, in those regions um, the infighting um, and conflict that's taken place among actually Christian nations um, um, uh, communities in in in. Um, I mean, well, other faiths, I'm sorry, Christians with Muslims and Jews. And um, it's extremely important right now. It was, we met wonderful people. Um, we are in the most, um, for us as, again, people of faith and uh, under, especially the Abrahamic um, um, Trinity, I call us, the Muslim Christians <laughs> and, and Jewish communities. It's this, this area is the seat of, who we are and how we came to be, and it's um, very unstable. And depending on which of those locations we were in, various members of our um, that 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 family, those families are being impacted in some really detrimental ways. And for us to continue to uh, put all of the focus and emphasis on fighting in military and war. Um, destabilizes those communities even more. Well, and I think one of the things that I heard, particularly when we were in Beirut, and they were talking about the refugee situation in Lebanon, um, not only the Syrian refugee crisis, but also the Iraqi refugees who exactly. are still there, and Palestinian refugees, frankly. And so um, we know that our government had a role in some of the destabilization in Iraq, and um, you know, I think that you know many people know that FCNL had a, at a time, uh, our war is not the answer campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and what's striking to me is, I think many people know, agree with that, war is not the answer, and um, would like to see an alternative, would like to see if diplomacy can work. And, um, and yet, if we don't fund it in the State Department, right. it's not gonna work. And if we put more money into the Pentagon, we're gonna wanna spend that money uh, on uh, weapons or on, it becomes a more militarized way to look at the world. So the difficulty is that we are. Uh, it's difficult to see the results of diplomacy right away. <laughs> it takes time. It's kind of uh, like Martha said earlier about how you can go and visit and, and, and engage a legislator. You know, one, two, three, maybe nine times, and it isn't until the tenth time that maybe something happens and you see and know that it made a difference. Right. Diplomacy is one of those kinds of. It's that. It's that kind of thing. Um, but it has worked over time, and there's ebbs and flows, but we can't give up on that. And so that is truly a faith walk. And so for us as people of faith, um, and as we are engaging, um, we have to continue even if you're not seeing the results right away. 
but we have to do what we can to encourage our legislators um, that that is not, you say war is not the answer. And we have to continue to work at various ways of engaging and relating um, to find out what that answer ultimately will be, mm -hmm. what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Well, we have some examples. I mean, certainly the diplomacy has worked with the Iran deal, and we're we're hopeful that that exactly. deal will stick. Um, we're concerned about that. Um, certainly, there are people right now, as folks are listening, there's concern about what's happening in North Korea because we don't have strong diplomatic uh, agreements, and so building our diplomacy core, building our efforts at the State Department, understanding that. Just the way we are, you know, we we need to think of ourselves in in relationship with other countries as well, and so that's that's part of what uh, our orientation is and our hope is that we would really think about that. What's been interesting to me is around this debate about the funding for the State Department is that we see, actually see a lot of military people saying fund the State Department because they know that that's an essential part of our foreign policy, and so um, I just I want to I want to bring that in um, to the conversation. Um, I want to go back a little bit and talk to a, a little, just kind of circle again about um, what effect people, ordinary people can have, people who aren't paying attention, you know, all day, every day about the federal budget or aren't paying attention all day, every day about what every senator is doing. Um, and, and talk a little bit about the storytelling again. I think, I think that's ext extremely helpful. And I think the notion of, uh, Martha, your comment about um, these aren't one-off conversations, right? That part of what we're doing and part of FCNL's training and work with people is to really focus on how do you build a relationship with a member of Congress and how do you, over, it doesn't happen in one visit, right? It happens because you kind of go back again and again and you start getting to know them. Uh, we have people in our audience who uh, publish op-eds and publish letters to the editor and their elected officials know them by their writing and uh, have seen that on a regular basis. We have people who, we have one um, person who comes in from Alaska, and every time he comes from Alaska, he goes over to visit uh, his senators, and Senator Murkowski knows him, and uh, that's great. We think it's incredibly important that people do those visits, but uh, talk a little bit about how that, how that, I mean, they're gonna, people are gonna get very specific instructions about like going into an office and how do you say it, but the impact. Um, can you say more about that? Yeah. Um, I was going to say, and I, I appreciate uh, Martha having been there to hear the stories and to help us to know what impact it has. Um, I was, in the meeting I was in yesterday, it was the first time uh, that I, in a long time, that I remembered this story. I used to work for the Attorney General's Office for the, uh, uh, Missouri, and I remember I was working on a case, um, and we had wanted it, and it looked every, like everything was fine. It was um, a workers' comp around Federal Reserve, and that was the issue whether or not they were federal or state. Uh, my boss, the Attorney General, was at his class reunion, and one of his classmates says, "Why aren't you all paying um, workers' comp to our veterans?" You know, and he's like, "What's going on?" He comes back to our office, and everybody from the chief counsel, uh, the the in-house counsel, my, the 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 my boss. There were like eight, nine people in this meeting because he was approached at his class reunion on an issue. <laughs> and that case became a major case in our office. Hmm. And it ended up going to the Missouri Supreme Court. My point being is that those conversations matter. Absolutely. Be it sitting in your member's office, calling your governor, you know, meeting them on the street, <laughs> whatever the case may be. Um, so, I mean, I cannot say with enough passion that your voice matters. And the phone calls matter, the visits matter. Um, I've sat in front of, I've sat in a member's office and let them know that I would pray for them. And I really was serious when I told them that I was gonna pray that they had restless nights and that <laughs> their spirit would be troubled uh, because leadership meant doing hard things. And I don't know if it was my prayer, but they did actually vote for cloture for uh, the, the DREAM Act. It didn't pass, but um, anyway, I just really believe, honestly, I can't say it enough. And they tell us that our voice matters. Martha, who's been there, yeah. who says that your voice matters. Yeah, 
I had two quick thoughts um, <laughs> stemming off that. One is the Dreamers is a great example, right? Yeah. This is a group of people who be went from being a population no one even had a name for to a group of people with faces and identities and stories. And I deeply believe that part of the reason we have seen good progress, we're not there yet, but good progress mm -hmm. in the direction of trying to do right by that group of people is because they became real. Exactly. And those young people were brave enough to step out and say, this is who you're talking about. You're talking about me. You're talking about my future. The other thing I'd say is um, just thinking a little bit about how do you how do you connect? How do you become that person at the class reunion, right? Well, one way is that you invite the legislators or frankly their staff someone in the district office i mean they have people all over your state or your district who work there every day they're part of your community invite them to come to some community event that you are involved in mm -hmm. some sort of service um, uh, activity that you're involved in some programming that your community provides and just have them bring them into who you are because then when the legislator says what's going on back home because they have to be here a lot maybe not as much as they should be lately but they have to be here a lot and <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they were reliant on those folks as their eyes and ears and when they say you know I actually just went to the food bank and they're telling me that people are coming in because they run out of food stamps um, and that benefit really isn't adequate and they're seeing a lot more hungry kids that sends a message back that says, well, wait a minute, mm -hmm. there's something going on in my community because their staff actually experienced it or they experienced it. So I think don't think of them just sitting behind a desk and you coming in a supplicant. Mm -hmm. What you're actually trying to do is make your communities right. tighter and more connected so they know what you are experiencing and what your neighbors and communities are experiencing. And, and I think partly, you know, I, I want to go back and just restate, we are a nonpartisan organization. I mean, we talk to Republicans, we sure. talk to Democrats, we talk to independents. And, and the fact is that they all do care about their communities and they care mm -hmm. about their states and they do want their staff and to the extent they can be out and about and hearing something. They may disagree with us and we may disagree with them, but I think that's a great example of, of getting people out. And another reason why, I mean, it doesn't matter what the person's party affiliation is, we need to go in and, and meet with them and talk to them. And so I want to restate that because a lot of times people get discouraged. And I think this election in November really was a first you know for a lot of people it, on the one hand it's been really challenging for especially I, I was just asking Martha before you know someone who worked in the Obama White House we're seeing you know changes and we we for some of the issues we care about around health care for example have been doing a lot of defensive work on the other hand what's what's exciting is we are seeing more people who are truly engaged yeah. the people who are listening to this today that are in these house parties want to exercise their um, civic rights in a sense and that this representative democracy that is tremendously exciting I think to me and to all of us here so I you know and you can get better at it I mean we get better when we practice things and it doesn't have to take hours and I think the other things I just want to reflect on is we are going to provide people with data we're going to provide people with fact sheets you're going to get information but if you take anything away from this I think the most important thing is not necessarily how many statistics do you know or can you recite exactly what's going to happen in the budget at any given time or what happened historically. The more important part is one, showing up and two, telling your story, right? I mean that's really what, what's going to make a difference in terms of having an impact on these uh, elected officials. So that's part of what we hope will, will happen as a result of, of this activity today. Um, we're gonna. We, I think we have about five minutes left or so, and I just want to ask if you have any other general comments about either uh, the federal budget um, that you want to make sure that we get in, uh, so people know in terms of the timing where we are right now, or about our, how we proceed as people of faith. Uh, Andrea and I are part of a, um, and and FCNL and the National Council of Churches is part of a really robust community of faith-based voices here in Washington D.C. and. Um, it's really, um, I think, for all of us who do this work with each other in an ecumenical way, it is incredibly powerful to do this uh, together. And, and we also do some things on our own, but, I, but I, I am excited about that. And that may be another way people get active in their local communities, is to do it on an ecumenical basis. Or to do it people of faith and people who don't necessarily profess faith. These, this can all work together. So. But let me stop talking. Do you have anything else, Martha, you want to? No, I love what you just said, and I strongly agree with it. I guess the only thing I'd add is just a little add-on to what you said, which is, yes, you don't need to be the master of statistics. You don't need to know a thing about the federal budget process. You need to be able to walk in the door and say what's important to you. 
if you can connect it back to something that is a specific has a specific federal funding source that's kind of you don't need to do that but that's all the power that you need to walk in the room if you can say you know what in my community we have long waiting lists for child care vouchers because you know there's nowhere near enough federal funding coming to them that's all you need Just an example of something where a, a decision in the federal budget is directly impacting your community and it could be anything just to illustrate that you see the connection between the budget decisions they make everything else don't worry about it it's their job to be experts it's not your job to be experts you have plenty of other jobs and roles in your community but doing a little bit of the homework that says well, okay when I say the federal budget is important to me what do I mean do I mean special education dollars is that your passion talk about the need for special education services and you can pick the thing that makes your heart beat strongest and find it a little federal link and then just walk in with confidence and as you said tell your story I think that's absolutely right um, I think also uh, be okay, be comfortable with using uh, faith language mm -hmm. that is important to you. A lot of times we feel, we, we realize that we're nonpartisan and that the person may, you know, if, and because we're, um, we want to affirm various faith traditions in the ways we live our lives, that's great. But you are going as a person who encompasses certain values as a person of faith, use that language. Mm -hmm. um, the joke on with us on the hill is some of us started calling the you know this this uh, appropriations bill I do think is immoral um, and one friend of mine who is like it's sinful mm -hmm. I mean some people don't like certain language if it's comfortable for you and your faith tradition use the language that works for you because you can articulate that helps articulate your passion and get your point across thank you I do want to just reiterate there is so much at stake right now. Um, we are seeing the potential for a massive shift in how our federal government uh, funds local communities, how it funds programs that are serving people who are not only people who are low income, but people who are middle income. And that fundamental shift, I think, will have reverberations for generations. Yes. And so we really are at a moment in time where every voice is so essential. Um, in every community with every lawmaker. So it is truly our hope that uh, when people finish, go to the next step uh, of this conversation this afternoon, that they will think about what will it take? You know, there's a lot of conversation around the elections about people making a plan for how they're gonna go vote, right? Well, start thinking now, what's your plan for how you're gonna go talk to your member of Congress. How are you going to talk to your senator? Are you going to pick up the phone? Are you going to drive by that office and drop some material off? Um, are you going to um, pick up the phone every Monday? Is that going to be your, you know, I mean, there's a sort of exercise of practicing, you know, just like we Put exercise the to get strong. the speed dial. Speed dial. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, seriously. And call it every day. Yep. Or every hour. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I want to I want to uh, just say that we're, we're we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I want to reiterate that uh, everyone listening to this is invited to come to Washington D.C. and lobby with us at the Quaker Public Policy Institute, November second through the fifth. Um, FCNL.org is our website, and there's a lot of material and more on that. But I do especially want to thank Martha and Andrea for joining us today. It's thank it's you. a delight to me to be able to talk with you and. Um, you've been so generous to give up your Saturday afternoon uh, to come and do this. Uh, Andre was saying earlier, she's like, I'm so impressed you have people watching this on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon. But, Thank you. But I'm right back at you. You guys yeah. have really been, been great. So, so we are honored. I want to give a shout out to the FCNL staff who've done such a great job in organizing this. And um, there will be more to come. So thank you very much for joining us today. Great. Thanks for having us. Thank you.